Okay, welcome to the last talk of the session. Our speaker is Dom Williamson from Stanford University. He's going to tell us about topological defect networks for fractons of all types. Dom, I will, you have 25 minutes plus five minutes for questions. Um, I'll uh, try to let you know in a chat when your time is getting close to up. Take it Great, away. thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here to tell you guys about this, virtually at least, because I think um, it's a topic that's kind of going back and forth between people studying topological codes and topological phases of matter. And I want to kind of put the question back to people who are interested in topological codes. Um, and sort of a funny story, I guess the first QRP I ever went to, I saw this nice talk by Benny Yoshida. And in some sense, that was kind of after a whole bunch of work on this, which I'll kind of give a history of in the talk had been done. Some nice progress had been made. And in some sense, he was putting the question back to um, topological phase of matter people to classify this strange class of phases I'll introduce. And we have had some progress on that and we have some ideas and now we wanna kind of bring those ideas back into topological codes and use our new developments to say something about the codes that are there beyond uh, maybe stabilize the codes. Great, uh, let me start. Um, yeah, before I get into anything, I should say thanks for this really enjoyable collaboration, especially before it all went on to Zoom meetings <laughs> with um, Dave, Danny, Abhinav and Kevin. Um, and the way I want to motivate this for this audience is, um, as we've heard a few times in this session, thinking about the important problem of protecting our quantum information um, in a quantum computer. And there's this nice idea that goes back to Kataev, which uh, is to think about having some kind of quantum hard drive. So we really want to think there's some, we can dream there's some chunk of material out there and it's like some weird spin liquid and like you can actually encode like the, um, your, inf your quantum information into the degenerate ground state of this. And you could really leave it just sitting there in its natural low at low temperature revolution and then come back to it sometime later and decode. Um, and this sort of setting I've said where you don't kind of actively monitor it like in the previous talk uh, is usually called passive or self-correcting um, uh, topological memory. If the time that you can leave it and still sort of have some good chance of decoding it is scaling at least sort of polynomially with the linear size. And I'm gonna use L to denote the linear size of a block. And most of my, my blocks in this talk will be 3D. Um, so what is this block that I've drew in the previous slide? Here's sort of a 2D cartoon picture of the idealization we're working with to make everything more precise. We're imagining spin systems for this talk and our Hilbert spaces are gonna be given by a tensor product of these spin systems on some uh, square or cubic lattice. And then we're gonna um, consider Hamiltonians that are given by a sum of local terms which I've drawn in orange here. And we're only gonna think about the class of systems that have some kind of uh, stability due to the presence of a spectral gap. So kind of in the thermodynamic limit, there might be some degenerate uh, manifold of states and there'll be like a finite energy gap and we can allow some sort of exponential splitting of the ground space. I'm not gonna worry about this sort of issue here, but then there's like a finite uh, constant uniform spectral gap to the excited states. Okay. and. There's kind of a really nice connection between a certain exotic kind of like ordering of these phase of, of uh, sorry, these states that can happen and quantum codes against local errors. So up here, I have this condition of topological order on the lattice, which is basically just saying if you have a local operator and you project into the ground space, it acts like a just a C number. And you'll see that this basically matches the nil Laflamme condition for correcting local errors. Um, and let just for simplicity assume that like the product of two local errors is still a local error, then it matches exactly. Um, so this kind of reduces, well, shows you some equivalence between sort of classifying these uh, quantum topological codes and these topological phases of matter, which we, uh, we, we sort of collect a bunch of these Hamiltonians into one qualitatively qualitatively similar equivalence class where the equivalence relation is given by smooth deformations. Uh, so we say, for example, here, H naught is equivalent to H1 if there exists some smooth deformation which matches H naught at one end and H1 at the other end. That preserves this locality property, also preserves a spectral gap property and um, interpolates between them. And then in this sort of toy picture of parameter space, so there's many more directions than I've drawn, but um, here I've just drawn two directions you kind of break up this in this phase this uh, phase space into some phase diagram of gapped phases that are disconnected by some gapless phase transitions. And the point is that every, you can prove with, that within one gapped phase, uh, all the Hamiltonians in there qualitatively behave very similarly 
And so we've kind of reduced this problem of understanding this code behavior to this problem of classifying these phases, these topological phases. And so what, what's been done there? Uh, fortunately, we have quite a lot of progress at this point, at least in low dimensions. So in 1D for spin systems, you can prove there's nothing there. Um, it's just the trivial phase. And the trivial phase is basically the phase of the product state or plus state, say. Um, so this is no good for uh, topological memory, which is why we so often hear about 2D, um, which is the lowest dimension where you can do anything with spin systems. And there we have this really nice uh, connection, which we heard a bit about in the last talk, um, where depending on the setting to some degree, there are rigorous proofs and sort of very strong arguments that all of these phases can be described by topological quantum field theories. Um, and these topological quantum field theories in 2D are even nicer, sort of have nicer structure than in general, where they are described by some anion model, basically. Um, these anions are moved around by string operators, but unfortunately, uh, for reasons I'm not gonna really go into here, having string operators sort of precludes this self-correcting quantum memory. So this all becomes a story about active quantum error correction, which is like a beautiful story that I'm not gonna go into any further here. But the point is we kind of have a very nice tools from TQFT to reason about this uh, error correction because we can kind of, if we're not worried about the lattice model, just some sort of qualitative behavior, we can do everything at the level of these nice uh, TQFT models and prove things uh, like no-go results, for example. Um, and there's like a, a sort of a famous and nice paper uh, that I can give as an explicit example doing this by I think Beveland et al. Um, that is sort of precluding possibilities for sort of, well, what would be equivalently a transversal gate in this setting using these ideas. Um, so when we go to 3D, what do we have? Again, there's like some axis of TQFT states. I've, oh, phases, sorry. I've drawn one, but you can imagine this keeps going up and there's a whole list of them. You'll also notice that a stack just of decoupled 2D things that were topological in 2D is gonna be a topological order in 3D by my definition before. Um, unfortunately, these both suffer from this sort of string operator problem. So we're not gonna get self-correction from these things. Um, but this leaves kind of an open space. Is there some possibility of something um, beyond these two things? It's not a TQFT or a stack of things. Um, and these we now call like fractal topological orders. Um, and it's kind of often said they're beyond TQFT because they're not exactly given by a TQFT in 3D or some stack of 2D TQFTs. Um, to be a non-trivial fact on topological order, you have to be explicitly beyond a stack of 2D TQFTs. Okay, so where did this come from? Or is there even anything there? Um, and this actually started in the condensed matter community, uh, people thinking about topological order. And Claudio Schumann was, uh, I think it occurred to him based on some sort of classical glassy spin models that maybe some model with topological order would behave more like a glass than a liquid, which all the TQFTs you can think are kind of liquid-like. They have properties that don't depend on them being deformed. But he had some brainwave, I guess, that maybe with this topological order condition, you could have something that behaves much more glassy. So it has very sensitive dependencies on the system size um, and the shape of the system, which here you see through the ground space degeneracy being some greatest common divisor of the length, which is very weird and would never happen in a TQFT. So let me very briefly say some phenomenology of this model and how it's different from a TQFT. Instead of having string operators, you have this uh, local charge cluster, which is created by an error. And I'll just look at X errors. Um, and it creates this sort of little uh, quadrupole of charges. And then as you stack these operators, you um, can separate out a single one of these charges, which cannot move on its own. It can only scatter into like three charges. So we call that thing a fracton in the, the terminology we now use. A pair of these guys can actually move in a line. So we call this a line on, this is very creative. And you can make a more complicated uh, com combination um, which I can't show in this model in a picture, but I'll show you an example later that we call plane on because it can move in two different directions that form, you know, span plane. Um, and in sort of the terminology that we're using, which is what, you know, hence the title, um, this is called a type one fraction order. And basically type one is this catch-all class that's basically saying just, it's something that's not a TQFT. That's essentially all it means, but it is a topological order. Okay, uh, now the big development, I think that's interesting for people um, studying quantum codes, it was due to Zhang Wanha. So we had this like example that sort of showed there could be something beyond TQFT, but it still had these string operators. And there was this nice paper I put a reference for um, studying the code properties of this a little bit by uh, Bravi Taral and I think Lemus. And um, I think it kind of, the, the point is basically that's not much better than a stack of 2D Torah codes as the code. It's a bit disappointing, but you know, there's, it raises this question, like what's out there? Could there be some magical hunk of material that could exist as like a 3D chunk that's just gonna be an amazing memory? 
Um, and so Zhong, uh, and, and uh, as, as I said before, maybe the short kind of catchy version of the goal you want to achieve is that there's no string operators. If there's no string operators, you might believe it's going to be a very good memory. Um, and so Zhang Wenha sort of set up this brute force search over some simple class of models on the cubic lattice, two spins per site, um, and found a bunch of models. The most nice one I've shown the stabilizer generators of here. And the point of this model is that, you know, Zhang Wen has this nice argument to prove there's no string operators. It's a sort of cleaning argument. I recommend looking at this paper. It's, it's a very nice argument. And this is what we now call a type two fractal order. So type two like means something very specific. It's not just this catch all. It means that you're like this non TQFT um, code, but you also have no string operators. So any sort of combination of charges that remains topologically non-trivial, there can never be a string operator moving this. And this is kind of, this is already getting you thinking, yeah, this is gonna be a really good code. I'll have some properties that are much better than these uh, TQFT codes. Um, so let me just show you a little example of how the charges and op logical operators work in this kind of class of codes. So the, a, a simple kind of cluster of charges is going to occur at the, the corners of a tetrahedra. And then as in like string operators, where you stack the strings end to end to move these charges further apart, you stack these tetrahedras to spread these charges further apart. And this kind of goes in this fractal pattern. So you can spread apart like a cluster, a constant cluster of charges for in this case, um, by sort of, you know, moves that require more and more operators. Um, and then you can sort of stretch them over the whole lattice, if you like, to achieve some sort of logical operator if they sort of fit perfectly. And one uh, key point of this is if you do this via local moves that some sort of local error model would do, you have to overcome a logarithmic energy barrier in the length of the system, uh, which is very different to a string operator, which only has to overcome a constant error, er, er, energy barrier. And another property of this, which I'm not going to really go into, but it's just something that shows you this is far beyond TQFT in some sense, is that um, the ground space degeneracy problem of this is kind of basically a packing problem, more or less, of uh, how you can pack these fractals into some uh, finite lattice up to some equivalence, which gives you very erratic behavior um, that could not be replicated by a TQFT. So to sort of wrap up this history of where we kind of got to in uh, quantum codes like a, a decade ago, basically, with these ideas, was that with this cubic code, um, if you used it as this sort of if you try to use it as a self-correcting memory, it actually does basically behave like a self-correcting memory, unfortunately, only up till some critical um, length. So for a system size is smaller than this, it really looks like it's working. And then you get to this critical length. Um, and in some case, in some sense, like sort of entropy wins against your energy barrier. And then um, you no longer have self-correcting behavior. So, so strictly, it's not a self-correcting quantum memory because in the thermodynamic limit, it's not. But actually, if you can kind of scale the um, the, the temperature with the system size, it sort of is. So it's this weird boundary case, which was called partial self-correction. And this is sort of a very interesting physical property of the model that has to do with thermalization, uh, how it thermalizes in a very interesting way. Okay, so in some sense, this is kind of the pinnacle, I guess, of where things got to in, in quantum codes. And the problem was sort of thrown back to uh, people in topological phases of matter. There are these weird phases and like, we don't really know what's going on with them. And then Benny had this nice uh, paper and talk that was kind of, um, constructing a whole infinite family of these beyond the sort of 18 that John Wan looked at. Um, there was also a nice paper by Isaac Kim looking at a, a bunch more of these models. It seemed like these things were like very plentiful and we didn't really know what was going on with them, just that they were outside the TQFT classification. And then um, Ha went and worked with some condensed matter people and basically sort of established some program of thinking about these phases in a more um, sort of uh, structured way. And the, the first thing they kind of did that really took off with people was define an even simpler model to look at because people in condensed matter like really simple toy models that you can just play with um, all day you know, and just do everything you want, calculate everything you want without having to use any sort of heavy machinery. And the model that really took off was this X cube model. It's a, just a different version of this type one uh, fracton order that's a bit simpler than Shimon's model. The ground space degeneracy is again, not equivalent to something you can get from layers, but in this case, it only comes from this um, uh, uh, correction, a constant correction which is kind of a bit surprising. Um, and the way I've drawn it, the, it's a Hamiltonian living on the cubic lattice with one qubit per face. And you have two, um, uh, sorry, two, two Z generators per cube and one X generator per vertex, which is 12 body. The Z generator is a four body and they kind of wrap around the cube in different directions here. This one wraps around like this, this one wraps like this. And I wanna give you a bit more detail of this one because I'm gonna use it as the example for our construction later. So 
a lo the basic local charge cluster in this model in the X sector is um, looks very similar to the, the Shimon model. And it basically makes four individual fractons that cannot move, like cannot hop on their own, but they can scatter into three particles as shown. And when you pair them up, you can then use these like plicket operators to move them around, right, in a, in, a, in two directions. So they end up becoming a plane on in the plane that's sort of orthogonal to the, the vector separating them. Um, in the other sector, which is inequivalent because there's no sort of symmetry between the X and Z sector here, you have um, four kind of excitations per cube, which I have labeled by their stabilizer um, syndrome. And these end up being line on. So a single uh, one of these sort of excitations can already move in one direction without just can hop in one direction to itself. So you get three inequivalent ones, which I've drawn in different colors here, which can move in the different on the different axes. And then they can all meet and fuse at a point. Or in other words, uh, any of these operators can turn a corner up to leaving behind a charge that kind of goes orthogonally to the turning. Okay, so that's the basic um, things you need to know about this XQ model. It's led to a whole bunch of study and a whole bunch of abstraction. And we've actually come up with like just a whole bunch more models that are even more complicated. So we, it's kind of digging ourselves deeper into this problem, I guess, that maybe I can blame Benny for starting. Um, and so I'm not really going to go into detail about any of these models. There's kind of a rough, uh, incomplete reference list here, the top right. Um, but we can really get kind of crazy things with these. We can get sort of, you know, and we can introduce non abelianness um, in this way. And to kind of, mm, this might be a little bit facetious, but you can kind of think of these models as being like taking some 3D TQFT and some 2D TQFT layers, at least a lot of the models, and you couple them in sort of a non-trivial way to get this new model that you can then show as beyond 3D TQFT or 2D TQFT layers, but still has topological order. And so we just have this whole, I don't know, world of models and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. And that's where um, the new development comes into the story. So. I think this, I could say, probably largely driven by Dave Asen's insistence the whole time that all of this should be described by TQFT, even though people keep saying it's beyond TQFT. And he turned out to basically be right, I, I guess. Um, and to put a more fine point on the, where the inspiration came from to finally make this idea work to describe everything as a TQFT phase, um, there's this nice paper by Elson Thorngren that was classifying symmetry and rich topological orders via some network of invertible defects. And so the, basically the step to go beyond, beyond that was just to say, what if we include some non-invertible defects, topological defects into our TQFT? Um, and so this defines uh, this new class of um, sort of phases that we'll call topological, that we're calling topological defect networks. Um, and we want to argue that they can basically describe all sorts of fractal models. Um, so let me just say how, how this, these models are defined. Basically, you take some space and there could be like a microscopic underlying lattice one of the points is we don't we want to get away from this so maybe you can imagine there's a very small lattice scale and then on top of that small cubic lattice scale you put in some def network of defects it doesn't have to be a cubic lattice it can be more general than that but for the purpose of illustration i'll consider a cubic lattice and on this lattice scale you put in some network of defects into the tqft so in your sort of three strata these blocks of many sites you have 3d tqfts and they don't have to be the same in every block. If you want it to be translation invariant, obviously you, you would do that, but it's not, not essential. And then between these blocks, they're kind of coupled together by having domain walls. So these could be, for example, gap boundaries um, to vacuum, or you could have invertible domain walls there, or you could have non-invertible domain walls there. Just any domain wall that's sort of consist topological domain wall that's consistent with the TQFTs on either side. At the, the one strata where these things meet, you have a one-dimensional topological defect um, that is consistent with all of these meeting domain walls. So co-dimension two topological defects might be a bit uh, unfamiliar to people who look mostly at 2D because in 2D they end up being a point, which is kind of trivial. Um, but here, the sort of this extended thing that's, that's one dimensional. Um, and then, yeah, you still have finally at these points, there's some kind of topological charge given all the other defects you can assign to a point and you just basically pick a projector onto a particular topological charge there. So this is the construction. This gives you some fair, um, class of uh, wave functions. You can sort of enumerate them, like you enumerate all the TQFTs, then all of the defects, then all of the uh, one-dimensional defects consistent with that. In practice, this is kind of difficult, but um, in principle, you can do this. And it gives you a nice class of things to look at, which hopefully describe everything. Uh, so for example, one, one uh, construction you could look at is just stick a 3D Torah code or several into the uh, three strata. And then you could pick, for example, smooth uh, flux condensing boundaries on the, the two-dimensional uh, defects. 
on the one-dimensional defects, this actually ends up reducing to a 2D Toro code um, boundary problem. And then there's some sort of simple charge projector um, at, at the, the, the point. And I'm gonna give you some specific examples that follow this. But first, let me say, sorry, advances, like why you would sort of make this different construction of all these, these phases. And as I said at the start, I think one thing people are interested in condensed matter is kind of taking a continuum limit and getting away from any specific lattice model to a field theory description. And this really lets you kind of do that immediately. You can kind of abstract away the lattice and just keep the defect lattice. And the defect lattice is what tells you all about the mobility and the properties of the phase. The microscopic lattice is sort of no longer important. Um, and for the same reason, you can abstract it away in topological quantum field theories themselves, you can abstract it away here. Um, this also divides these kind of uh, complicated topological states into pieces we more or less understand, at least we understand them better than the fracton models themselves. And then you can use your understanding of these pieces to build up the properties of the model you've made. Um, and then I think the interesting point for uh, people in quantum codes is that within this class of wave functions, which as I say, hopefully describes everything, you can use the sort of far more structure they have than just some lattice model with a topological order condition to um, hopefully constrain what is possible with them. For example, like self-correction or uh, transversal gates. Okay, so let me try and give you one example in quite a bit of detail that, that kind of illustrates how this works. So this is why I introduced the XQ model before because it's like probably the best model to give examples with because it's as simple as possible without being trivial. And in this example, on the three strata, we sort of pack in blocks of 3D Torah code. On the two strata, you see, I'm going to, sorry, let me just go over the uh, outline first. On the two strata, we, we're going to put in some flux condensing boundaries, um, also called smooth boundary, I guess, in the lattice model. And then, as I said earlier, on the one strata, this ends up reducing to some problem of a gap boundary of 2D Torah codes, which makes it a lot easier to describe that part. Um, and then there's some kind of trivial topological charge projector on the points. So to tell you what I mean by the flux condensing boundaries, in a, in a block of 3D Torah code, there are essentially two types of um, gap boundaries to vacuum um, up to stacking with some boundary states. Uh, and they're described by what condenses there. So in the, the, the topological charges in this case is a point like E charge, Z2 E charge here, and a string like um, M flux, they braid with a minus one phase. So only one of them can consistently condense at any boundary. And you have essentially two kinds of boundaries. One's that, one that can absorb these uh, charges, so you can pull a charge out of this boundary for free, and one that can absorb these fluxes. And it's important that it can absorb the fluxes like uh, piecewise. It doesn't have, you don't have to push a whole loop in at once. You can push part of a loop in. So you can have, one, when you have this flux condensing boundary, you can have an arc of loop ending there, a flux loop. Great. So if I have a domain wall in Torah code, by some, you can imagine sort of folding or reflecting about this domain wall and actually ends up becoming just a gap boundary to vacuum of two copies of 3D Torah code. Um, and it sort of turns out that actually there is nothing be besides the trivial domain wall of just having nothing there. There's nothing beyond these um, pairs of gap boundaries to vacuum of the individual Torah codes in this case, up to, up to attaching some surface anions, which we're not gonna consider here. Um, and the, the choice we actually take in this defect network is this flux condensing boundaries. So everywhere where you have this uh, two strata, you just put in a pair of flux condensing boundaries. OK, um, that choice being made, we can now look at the one strata. And I'm going to show you how it reduces to a problem of 2D Torah code boundaries. So within the vicinity of this one strata, we have these uh, domain walls meeting. We can kind of puff those domain walls up because they're actually a pair of flux condensing boundaries. And I've also kind of puffed up the um, uh, one dimensional defect. And oops, sorry. Then in the vicinity of this defect, you can do this kind of trick, uh, which reduces the 3D Torah code to a 2D Torah code. So you have some flux condensation on the surface, um, which means that the M flux can end there. And then when you just sort of fold this down into, uh, so, so you just kind of fold these two uh, surfaces together to make it look like a 2D slice. And the E charge becomes the 2D E charge of the 2D toric code, sorry. The M flux becomes like point-like in this dimension reduction and becomes the M charge of the 2D toric code. You can kind of check this works carefully, but I hope you take my word for it. Near this point, you have these three incoming uh, 2D toric codes effectively now by squeezing the 3D toric codes into a thin piece. You then fold these and you have just a gap boundary to vacuum of four copies of toric code. 
Um, now we have to determine this uh, gap boundary to vacuum. And the way you do that, extending the, the case for a single copy is basically, you have to pick four independent charges that are mutually bosonic. Um, and to, to mimic the, the charge patterns of the um, X cube model, here we pick uh, the four E charges, one from each layer, and then pairs of M fluxes that braid with that trivially. Um, and let me just, I'm, I'm right at the end of showing you how this example works, which I think I'll then wrap up afterwards, Steve, that's good. Um, the reason why this ends up matching the X cube model is because this, when you sort of unfold everything and reinflate, the charge pattern created by, you know, sort of popping these E's out of the uh, one dimensional edge is exactly the same shape as the charge pattern in the X cube model. And you can sort of check more carefully that the charge theories in this sector are isomorphic. So you have this on every uh, edge, and then you can kind of make these charge patterns that are exactly the same as X cube. The line on the sort of flux sector is a little bit more complicated, but these end up matching the line ons. And the basic reason they do is because you have these pairwise e, uh, M condensation, sorry, which allow the arc of flux to hop through the edge. So essentially there's only one uh, unique arc of flux associated to each edge. Sorry. Then due to the properties of the toric code bulk, you can create a little loop of M flux from nothing in the bulk and push it into the edges near a corner. And it gives you from vacuum three of these um, arcs of flux, flux near an edge. This should remind you of the X cube line on sector. And finally, to see that these, these arcs actually have mobility, you can use this move above to push one arc uh, on an edge to the two adjacent edges that are orthogonal. You can pop them through using this uh, rule of popping through an edge and then merge them back into a single arc of flux that's on the same you know, oriented edge, but once one cube over. So this lets you just kind of move in a line that's along the line of your, your edge. And this ends up being exactly isomorphic to the charge sector of, sorry, the, the sort of Z sector of X cube. Um, just to wrap up this example, we, I argued to you that the charge patterns are exactly isomorphic to X cube. But if you want to be a bit more careful and see that it's really rigorous, you can actually write down a lattice Hamiltonian given this construction, because we have a lattice Hamiltonian for the Toric code and its boundaries and the boundaries uh, of the 2D Toric code effectively and then this charge projector. And then provably this, this Hamiltonian is like local unitary uh, equivalent to the normal X cube. It just has sort of a lot more redundancy. And then let me just make the point that there's sort of a more complicated model that comes from Haas cubic code. That's this type two. And this one you can also describe and basically you use the same strategy. You just make the charge clusters match the charge patterns in the model. And then essentially the flux sectors take care of themselves um, which is kind of nice. So great. Yeah, so we, I think the overall point of this is we now have like this general class of wave functions that should describe this whole world of like weird fracton lattice models, but with some uh, handle on it, not just sort of one random lattice construction after another. Um, and to really put the underline on it, even though people say sort of say a lot that these fracton phases are beyond TQFT, where here we're sort of demonstrating, at least by example so far, that they are not beyond TQFT. The most sort of popular fractal models, you can describe them all through TQFT. And we argue that this should be sort of fully general. These TQFTs with defects should describe all gap phases, which brings me to the final slide in the future directions, which is we are already working on this, proving that all gap phases can be described by defect networks. And so basically so far for stabilizer codes, you can essentially prove this. So even though I showed you some simple examples, other examples you like, like Haas code, anything with topological order, you can fit into this defect network and beyond. So you can also do all sorts of non-abelian things. Um, and the ultimate goal would be to prove that like all phases, all gap phases fit into this um, class of wave functions. And then to use the, the, the sort of nice structure we have there to put sort of no-goes and restrictions on them, similar to what like Joan has done nicely for stabilizer codes in 3D. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. Sorry for going over a little, a little bit. Thanks, Tom. Um... We sort of don't really have any time for questions. Um, uh, I mean, I'll maybe just ask one very quick question, which is uh, the lattice Hamiltonians, these are commuting Hamiltonians that you write down for all of these things? Uh, this for, so the example I showed, yes. Uh, this formalism actually goes beyond that because you can, you can stick in like chiral TQFT stuff on different layers, which would preclude like a commuting projector Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. But they're commuting, uh, let's say it's non-chiral, they're commuting 
in an absolute sense or commuting in like a Levin when sense where there's a sort of low energy sector where things commute? Um, yeah, I mean, it, depending how you write it, it would be in the Levin when sense. Like if you project everything into the okay. sector where you have closed string diagrams, they commute there. Okay, great. Um, so we're out of time. So um, we'll thank Dom again. 